Uh, what I would like to do is go through the slides and show you some, uh, also some videos. So just quickly, China Cube, China, China, China. The first China is Changnan, which is also Jingdezhen. The second China on the center is the China that you use. And the third China is the nation of China. Next, please. So Jingdezhen is located uh, along the Yangtze River tributary called Changjiang, which is part of Jiangxi. Next page. And Jingdezhen, the name of Jingdezhen was given to the emperor of the time because uh, he, uh, as a Jingde emperor, was so fam uh, fascinated by the beautiful China that they produced. So the town of Changnan, China, became Jingdezhen. Next. So today's Jingdezhen looks beautiful. During the Second World War, when the Japanese war planes were trying to destroy Jingdezhen, they couldn't see anything. It was uh, basically shrouded with smokes from all the firing of China. So because of that, Jingdezhen was saved. Next page. So we, were, we talked about the Silk Road. It should be the Silk Roads because there were many routes. And from the land through the desert to the Middle East, also from the ocean all the way to Africa and then Europe. Next page. So the Silk Road actually from China, the Ocean Silk Road or the Maritime Silk Road really started to gain reputation from the 14 hundreds and seven times by the, uh, Professor Zheng He, the voyages took seven different trips all the way to Africa. As you can see, the route is through South China Sea, the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, the Red Sea, and the East Coast of Africa. So the trade partners included Java, Sumatra, Malacca, the famous Malacca Strait is where you will find a lot of Chinese remnants, including people. And then we can see that they employ huge ships with 63 large ships with a crew of over 27,000 men. So to think about all the ships in Europe, uh, from Spain, Portugal, the Great Britain, and so on and so forth, none of them could compare with these huge maritime Silk Road uh, ships. Next, please. So again, if you have time, please try to study Zheng He, who came uh, from Yunnan province, as a Chinese minority, but eventually he was the diplomat. He was the trade ambassador. And over time, 250 ships carrying porcelain, lacquer silks, teas, and other precious Chinese goods went on, on uh, they were put on his ships and went all the way to Africa. Next, please. So if you ever go to Malacca, the Strait of Malacca, and you go to the city of Malacca, you will find such a huge uh, museum with the actual small models of the ships. And you can see on the left side, you can see the mothership, which is huge. Next page. And so there were also pirates because these ships carry so much, so many wonderful things, pirates lurking in the waters of Thailand in the ninth century. They may have disrupted the legendary silk routes of the sea because these pirates were vicious. They didn't worry about killing people. They just wanted to loot. So for a period of 75 years, pirates or a hostile naval force blocked passage through the Malacca Strait. And this strait is a very important strait. The modern pir pirates today still are there, not only off the Strait of Malacca or in Thailand, 
but everywhere else. If you remember during the time of the Vietnam War, many of the refugees had to travel uh, by sea and they were pirates around. And today you, you talk about African uh, sea uh, uh, land, uh, sea and land, you will find also many pirates going from uh, Africa uh, to be pirates. Next page, please. So as you see, generally the ships coming back from China would have sailed through the South China Sea and have passed through Vietnam, Singapore Strait, Strait of Malacca, the peninsula of uh, Malaysia and Sumatra. And so we all know about, I think, the Beiling Tong uh, 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 shipwreck. Beiling Tong is in the southeast end of Singapore and something happened right there. Next page. So the Beiling Tong shipwreck, it was found by local fishermen and they were actually looking for sea cucumber, the, a delicacy that the Chinese people love so much. So let's see if we can show a short video of the Beiling Tong shipwreck. Are we having difficulty with the... Great. So let's go on to the next one, please. So you can see 70,000 pieces of ceramics uh, from the Tang Dynasty, 12th century. So two important ar archeological discovery were the cargo with so many pieces of ceramics or China. And also uh, they found other things through the Billington shipwreck. Next, please. So I want to also interject in here, the East India companies. Uh, there is not one company, but many East India companies. Why? You know, the Dutch wanted to uh, place a base in India and from India all the way to China. So uh, the governor uh, and company of merchants of London uh, started the East Indian Company. The Dutch has had their thus East India Company as well as French. They have the French East India Company and the Portuguese East India Company and also uh, the Netherlands uh, and Austrian also had the East Indian Companies. Next one. So these companies had their purposes the purposes for these large corporations is to do trade, mostly to try and carry goods from China all the way to Europe. Almost uh, all of them had their uh, eyes on China, specifically on porcelain, on tea, and et cetera. Next one. So as you can see, with the, within the United States history, 
Also in Boston, the Boston Tea Party was a political protest that occurred on December 16th, 1773. Now this uh, uh, event was because of the British East Indian Company uh, bringing uh, tea into the harbor. And this was also part of US history uh, along with British East Indian Company, Company conflict. Next. East Indian uh, in East India companies have done many many trades and many people uh, made their monies through the trade and the company for almost 200 years had really transformed itself from a corp corporate entity into a state or an empire in its own right. Next one. So uh, if you want to learn more about uh, the East Indian companies, I, I, I hope you will uh, research and then we will be able to, all of us will be able to learn more about these trades from the British, from the Dutch, from the French, from the Portuguese. Next page. So because these companies had to have a headquarter, the city of Guangzhou in the province of Guangdong became one of the ports that opened up for such businesses. There is an area in Guangzhou where these 13 Hang were established. Hang in Chinese would mean company, 13 would mean Shi San. So you will hear about Shi San Hang, the 13 companies in Guangzhou uh, a lot. If you study any of the Chinese history about opening up to the West. So these Hangs are merchant houses or trading houses. Let's see the next page. So you can see a painting of the 13, 13 Hang in the harbor of Guangzhou in the city of Guangzhou or also known as Canton. Next page. So people knew, they knew that those ships left China, many returning to their home countries through these treacherous seas and many were uh, 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 sunk because of weather, because of other conditions. And so this gentleman called, or this uh, person, Mike Hatcher, in 1977, he formed a company to salvage scrap metals from sunken vessels. And in 1983, he stumbled upon a 17th century Chinese junk that went down uh, in South China Sea. So he and his crew salvaged more than 20,000 pieces of late Ming Dynasty porcelain, and he netted $2 million at Christie's auction house in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. Let's see the next page. So Mike Hatcher uh, was able to garnish a lot of money by uh, actually going down sea diving to look for different uh, ships. And this Gelder Mousen, a Dutch East India Company uh, merchant vessel sank in a storm in 1752 while on a return voyage from Canton to Amsterdam. And as you can imagine, porcelain, tea, raw silk, and gold, they were layered and layered onto the ship, but then the ship sank. So let's take a look at uh, uh, the uh, items that they were able to discover. And uh, in April of, 18, uh, of 1986, Christie of Amsterdam opened a five-day auction of they call the Nanking cargo. Nanking is Nanjing, Nanjing cargo. More than 20,000 piece people attended the auction. Among the people attending the auction were some Chinese from China. They were given a little bit of money with the hope to be able to buy some of the lost China. Unfortunately, there, the monies they were given was so little. They were not able to even get one piece out of this whole collection. An anonymous bidder 
paid $322,000 for 144 place dinner setting, while a Swiss banker bought a pair of butter tubs for $15,275. So all in all, this particular auction brought in more than $15 million. Next page, please. So there was another ship. The ship was called Taxing. And Taxing in Chinese is Dexing. It sunk in the South China Sea. It was salvaged in 1999. Now this ship came out of the city or the harbor of Amoy, also known as Xiamen, and it was bound for the Dutch East Indies with a large cargo, but also a lot of people. Many people died on this shipwreck, uh, but the Mike Hatcher's company located the wreck in South China Sea, pulling about 350,000 pieces of the ship's cargo. This is just totally amazing. Next, please, so we can actually see what is now today part of Texing. May I show the slide, please, uh, the um, uh, video? Hello, welcome back to sallyantiques.co.uk. Um, wanted to show you something interesting uh, today, uh, which shows the eclectic collection of uh, stuff we store here. Um, this in, in, selection here is uh, as from the wreck of uh, the Texing, which was a Chinese uh, junk, three masted junk. Uh, the translation is True Star. Unfortunately, this boat sank in 1822, uh, had uh, 1,600 passengers, 200 crew, and unfortunately only just over 200 were rescued by a passing ship. Um, in 1999, a British salvor, um, he discovered the wreck uh, and brought uh, a huge amount of uh, stuff to the surface. And uh, all this stuff was uh, auctioned in November of 2000 at an auction house in uh, Stuttgart in Germany. Uh, and we happen to have quite a selection of it here. There's various things, bowls, dishes, plates, uh, uh, drinking cups, all uh, glazed and unglazed. Um, and they're all available individually. Um, please have a look at sallyantiques.co.uk and you'll find out a lot more. Thank you. Next page, please. So as you can see, many shipwrecks, and I think there are still many more under the water, many more in the South China Sea, in Indian Ocean, Arabian Sea, etc. So this, and there's another one, Wan Li. Wan Li is uh, uh, the era of the Ming Emperor, Wan Li. The Wan Li shipwreck, uh, in, in 1625, a Portuguese vessel set off from China on a voyage via the Strait of Malacca, carrying a large amount of porcelain. As you know, we had a session before by uh, Hilda talking about the fascination of the Dutch people with the porcelain. Now every household, if possible, would want to have some. So you can imagine this particular vessel was carrying these uh, China uh, over to, uh, to Europe. However, the ship now named Wan Li never reached the Portuguese port. Uh, the ship rather sank in the South China Sea. The wreckage was discovered in the ocean off the coast. Uh, I don't know how to say that word, Terenga Ganu, uh, together with its cargo, six miles off the east coast of Malaysia. Uh, and uh, so the ceramics uh, began to appear in fishermen's nets in 1998. As you know, fishermen, they were looking for delicacies, fish, shrimp, as I said, sea cucumber and other things. But in their nets, they found these china, pieces of china. So the ship was found in 2004, loaded with Ming Dynasty blue and white porcelain. As you know, Ming blue, Ming blue and white. We all know they, they are very precious. The vessel became known as the Wan Li shipwreck after the recovered ceramics was assigned to a site in Jingdezhen during the reign of 
Emperor Wan Li in the Ming Dynasty. Uh, next page, please. Next page. So I want to show you uh, the uh, shipwreck of Nanghai Marine Archaeology site. So let's take a look. The Desaru shipwreck, circa 1830, shows a decline in the South China Sea trade. By this time, the porcelain being made in Europe was cheaper than the Chinese ware, and fewer ships sailed for China. Chinese porcelain did, however, maintain its Southeast Asia market, where more traditional designs were still appreciated. If nothing is done, and done soon, there may come a time when there will be no history to write about. UNESCO have repeatedly said that shipwrecks laying on the seabed for centuries can lay there another century or two, there would be no hurry to excavate the shipwreck. That's not true. Twenty years ago in this fishing village in Endau, there were two trawlers of that limited capacity. Today there are 400 of these boats with that maximum capacity and each one of them is out there spoiling uh, one wreck site after another. Just one example is the Turian shipwreck we discovered in 1996. There were then an estimated uh, 100,000 pieces of 600-year-old pottery. We went back to dive that site and there were no more than 10,000 pieces there at that time. 90,000 pieces have been dispersed by fishing trawlers and will never be found again. So, uh, sorry UNESCO, but it's got to be done now. For centuries, trading ships sailed the Nanhai, now called the South China Sea, as they followed the maritime equivalent of the Silk Road that connected China with the rest of Asia and beyond. By the 15th century, Malacca had become the most prosperous trading port along that route. All along the route, Chinese ceramics and other goods like silk were traded for regional indigenous goods that were regarded as luxury items in China. The Asian maritime silk route depended on the monsoon season. Next, please. So as you can see, the South China Sea uh, under the water has just so many possibilities. So in the early 20th century, the Chinese fishermen in South China Sea began to discover all kinds of ancient sunken ships while they were fishing. A total of four ships, all of the British origin were detected each of them full of relics from the old summer palace. Now, summer palace, for all of your information, was the summer place for the empress, empresses, princes to play in Beijing. May I see the next slide, please? Yeah. So this summer palace is also known as Yuan Ming Yuan, the old summer palace. It was such a fantastic place to be. Why do I say was? Because it was destroyed. It was looted. In front of the Hai Yan Hall of Yuan Ming Yuan, it, there was the royal garden of the Qing dynasty. Uh, so in front of this old summer palace, in the past, there were 12 zodiac animals, each representing one of the 12 animals of the Chinese zodiac. And at a certain time, each animal, the water would come out of the heads of one of the animals, depending on the time. Such a beautiful design was absolutely fantastic. And during the looting of the old summer palace, 
those animals disappeared. And today, people are still looking for some of them. But on the ships going toward Great Britain, meaning England, many of the heads were in there. So there, there the mystery could be probably solved by going into the sunken ships, the four British sunken ships. So next page. So we have a wonderful video to talk about the statues of the 12 zodiac animals. It is in Chinese. We will just show a little bit of it. If you are interested, please go online and go through it. And it's absolutely intriguing. 当时专家所以按照清代一般陈设和库房面积计算不会低于溥仪退位时故宫的文物数量也就是不会低于一百五十万件在这其中瓷器字画钟表名贵布料绸缎可以说是数不胜数但是要说其中知名度最高的莫过
oh, uh, the excavation, conservation, and research underwater. So over 180,000 pieces of cultural relics have been unearthed from the shipwreck. Next page, please. So you can see the actual excavation site. Uh, in, in this one, the Nanhai one was uh, uh, excavated in the spring of 2014. That was about eight years ago. Also, you can see the ex excavation site in the winter of 2015. So things were happening and you could see more. Next page. So I want to say that in the Maritime Silk Road Museum of Guangdong, and of course, uh, this is a, a place that I hope all of us will have a chance, chance to visit in the future. They were beautiful porcelain items uh, from the Jing Dezhen. They were excav excavated from Nanhaiwen shipwreck site. Next, please. So in April, 2020, British researchers uncovered 12 shipwrecks in the Mediterranean, which is of course part of Europe, this including a colossal 17th century vessel filled with artifacts such as Chinese porcelain, always, but Italian jugs and Indian peppercorns all together, 12 shipwrecks in the Mediterranean. So a British led expedition led uh, uh, found a cluster, a cluster of 12 ships on the seabed, 1.2 miles below the surface of the Levantine Sea using sophisticated robots. So today we have many sophisticated robots. We have also ways of surveillance, looking at the sea. So sea hunts are no longer something in the past, but also something in the future with great exploration and great discoveries. The ships were recovered in ancient ship lanes that, that served what we call the spice uh, route, the tea route, and the silk route. So we sometimes mix spices, teas, and silk, but actually also China, porcelain, you know, even the trades of the Greek, Roman, and Ottoman empires. Next page, please. So April, 2020, British researchers uncovered 12 uh, shipwrecks in the Mediterranean. As you can see, they meticulously try to clean them up. So you can see how beautiful the beautiful China uh, pieces were discovered. Next page. So many of the pieces were uh, are now on display in different collections. Uh, uh, the one that we talked about before, and also we're talking now, the uh, Sir David collection. Next, please. So Chinese ceramics are displayed in room 95 of the British Museum. The British Museum has one of the largest collections of Chinese ceramics. If you ever go to the British Museum, you need to absolutely take a small, take a, a trip to the room. The room is also big. Room 95 has many of the items. Next, please. Next, please. So also in uh, Washington, DC, uh, we have a collection and it's called China from China. It is porcelain and stories of early American trade. So it's not only uh, the, uh, the trade from uh, South China Sea all the way down, but also from Europe to America. I'm hoping that maybe we'll find some shipwrecks and we'll also find some stories that can be told uh, also through our uh, museum here. Uh, next, please. So I want to also talk about Sweden because the Swiss, uh, the Swedish people and the ships also went to China. There was a ship called the Jordaborg II. It, there is now a replica of this 18th century ship. And this was supposed to be resailing back to China through the trading route from Sweden to China. This interesting ship 
actually arrived into the port of Yotoborg, but it sank right in front of the people's eyes. So uh, the Swedish East India Company that I didn't talk, uh, uh, talk about before actually was established in 1731 to do trade to East Asia. It was situated in the city of Gothenburg or Göteborg. The company secured a 15 year monopoly on far Eastern trade. The company existed for 82 years and its vessels made 131 voyages using 37 different ships. And of course, some of the ship, ships sank. So let's see the next slide. So this, this slide shows actually the ship uh, of your to board. And uh, divers were first able to explore its shipwreck in, 19, in the 1980s. And later, next page. Uh, so the replica of this 18th century ship actually was made. And I personally had the opportunity to visit the actual replica. So it was called Yorteborg 2. It stands in Stockholm in April of 2022, it was supposed to set, set, set sail, but I don't know whether it made it or not. This part, you can always try to find out more. Next page. So I'm going to finish. This is also my last slide. What have we learned from the Ocean Silk Road? We learn about trading. We learn about pirating. We learn about looting. We learn about discovery. We learn about people to people. So stories that can be told from the shipwrecks are like time capsules. These time capsules are many still buried under the sea. Global commerce with trade winds coming from the winds to bring the ship over one way and to bring the ship back another way. And so we heard about spices, we heard about teas, we heard about gems, we heard about silks, we obviously heard about China. So the interconnectivity of arts and trades and cultures continue until today. So hopefully we'll continue our conversations later. Thank you so very much. Back to Dr. Ba. Um, Dr. Cheng, thank you very, very, very much for this wonderful talk number six in uh, uh, China Cubed. And it's really interesting because we're talking not only about the uh, relics and the ceramics that were found, but also about the importance of the maritime route itself, which is clearly as important as the overland routes. And, uh, and thank you for bringing all this uh, uh, to our uh, talk today. Um, it's interesting that the uh, sinking of a ship results in a large number of artifacts that may be intact as opposed to overland where uh, one doesn't have that luxury for future centuries. It's uh, uh, an interesting oddity of things. So between uh, burial mounds and sunken ships and the pyramids of Egypt and people's attics, uh, we find large amounts of stuff from prior uh, era. Uh, Hilda, uh, we now have Dr. Uh, Van Neck Yoder, who's going to be chatting with us uh, all the way from Holland. Uh, and, um, and she's going to be talking about uh, the um, uh, maritime route uh, from China all the way to uh, Netherlands. So uh, Hilda, if you uh, uh, would like to uh, continue, I want to also point out, by the way, that if you folks have questions, feel free to type them into the chat. And Elizabeth will be looking at the chat questions and we'll go over everything uh, um, in due time. Okay, we're more than happy to do all that. So uh, Hilda, go right ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, Lily, for inviting me to share the, uh, lecture with you and, and make some comments. Um, it is such a hot topic that you chose. Uh, I checked in on the internet, the Academia, which publishes all the papers, has 150,615 papers on uh, that discusses the protection of 
underwater um, uh, 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 treasures. Uh, so this is really a very important topic. And I wanted to just pick on uh, something. I just wanted to develop a point that is made in one of your videos. Oh, just a second. Uh, I, yeah, that's OK. Uh, just a second with this slide. I'm not ready for the next one. Um, I wanted to develop a, a point that Stan Schostrand makes in the little video that you showed when he says, UNESCO, you have to get on it. And the it is what is that? And it is the protection of these underwater treasures. Because as he mentioned in that little video, maybe some of you remember that in the 20 years that he has been doing that, there were, were two ships in the beginning that were looting, that were taking the treasures and then selling them for profit. And uh, now when he is making that video, and I think it is made in two, 2002 or something, um, there are 400 of these ships and there are looters, they are pirates, they're taking these treasures and we'll never see them again. So I wanted to talk today about the questions of why are people going out looking for these treasures? And once they find these treasures, who is the owner? What, and then of course, what are the ethics of the whole uh, issue of salvaging underwater treasures? And I just want to take two Dutch ships as examples. First of all, the Witteleer, the White Lion, which is actually the first ship that was salvaged in, um, let's see, in 1976. Uh, the ship was sunk in 1613, so it's a very early, early Dutch ship, uh, salvaged in the 1970s, early 70, in 76. And then I want to contrast that with the ship that um, Lily talked about, the Gelder Malsen, sunk in 1752, so an 18th century ship that was salvaged eight years later in a completely different way and uh, kind of became a turning point in the whole process of uh, salvaging underwater treasures. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Thank you. So um, let me see. Um, the importance of, which is just what, what, um, what Bob is pointing out, the importance of, of finding these treasures on the bottom of the ocean is because so much that was on land has disappeared. Um, there's, we, we know so little about that incredible Dutch obsession uh, in the 17th, 18th century with, with Chinese porcelain. Um, we, there, as I have just typed out, just some statistics, there were more than three million pieces of porcelain brought to the Dutch Republic within the first 50 years that the Dutch went to Asia. Then within the first 80 years, 12 million pieces of porcelain were traded with Europe and within Asia, India and Persia by the Dutch company, the VOC, the, the Dutch East India Company that um, Lily talked about. Then the 18th century, because the next ship that I will talk about is about the 18th century. In the 18th century, the in that five years, 1729 till 34, in those five years, more porcelain was imported than during all of the 17th century. And during the 17th century, there were already so many, 12 million pieces. So it is just a huge number of porcelain that went to Europe. And we know not very, I was almost going to say nothing, but there's practically nothing written about it in the Netherlands. The, next slide, please. The only evidence really so far until the uh, pieces were salvaged from the bottom of the ocean were paintings. Uh, and of course, the manifest, the, the list of items that went on board, they are also indicating how many pieces of porcelain would be uh, shipped. But on to, to actually see the pieces, we have to go to paintings. And I just have two examples here. Uh, one of the, on the left, we saw in our museum a number of years ago, and you can see, I think there are five pieces of those uh, uh, wonderful Chinese porcelain that are exhibited here. And on the right is a um, piece by Clara Peters in the Mauer's house. And Bob, we'll see that in a few weeks. It's about five minutes from my house. <laughs> and this and this wonderful plate of Chinese porcelain in, made by a woman painter from the 17th century. Next slide, please. How did the Dutch use these? And there is only one 
painting that shows how the Dutch use it because we really don't know much at all. It is a mystery why not much more was traded about it. But you can see here in this painting that these plates that came in were not used to eat off, <laughs> but they were used to show off. They show off your sophistication, your wealth, but more than anything else, the Chinese porcelain was actually a a a, 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 a yeah a metonymy you know you, you use the, the, that's a technical term it was an object that took the place of china and china in the early 17th century in the netherlands was a place where everything that was a but that was a failure in europe was wonderful in china china was seen as a utopia the Chinese emperor was surrounded by philosophers. He listened to the philosophers and the philosophers listened to the people and they didn't have all those horrible wars that they had in Europe. So when you look at a piece of porcelain, that is what that represented, an alternative to the reality that people had at, in, in Europe. It is not a surprise, therefore, that the first European translation of Confucius is made by uh, in Dutch by Peter van Horn, who actually went to see the emperor in 16, in the, uh, I think 1670s or so, trying to make, just trying to establish trade and total failure. Okay, next slide, please. But that's a different story. So the Dutch East Indy Company uh, existed for about 200 years. It made 5,000 voyages to and from Asia, but it's also a very important part traded within Asia. So it doesn't only trade from Asia to Europe, it also traded, their ships traded within Asia. In that period, they had 401 shipwrecks. And by the way, the United, Nes the United Nations, the UNESCO thinks that there are about three million wrecks still available for us to salvage on the bottom of the ocean. So anyway, the 401 shipwrecks. So the importance, and, uh, you know, Bob already mentioned that it is so interesting that these objects from shipwrecks are still available to us when they get salvaged because they have transformed the study of Chinese porcelain, because as, as uh, Lily mentioned, they are time capsule. When, when you see a piece from a ship from 1614 and you know the ship is from 1640, then you know that's what they made in that time, before that time, and it was not made after that. So it's really important has transformed the study of Chinese porcelain. I have a little painting here of a shipwreck, <laughs> just a detail to show you how horrible it was to have a shipwreck. Next slide, please. So first of all, I want to talk about the first ship that was sell where the uh, that was salvaged, and that is the Vita Leo, um, which uh, I've put a little stamp here, a British stamp of in honor of the Vita Leo, which is in Saint Helena, Helena, and and it was exploded in 1613 uh, in a fight with the Portuguese. And so it manifests, listed that it had 24 cannons, loads of pepper, loads of silk, oh, so many spices, and 1300 diamonds. But interesting enough, it had no porcelain. The other ships that were with it had a lot of porcelain. The Vitelio had no porcelain listed on its manifest. So in 1977, the maritime archaeologist, this is very important, he was an archaeologist, he was not a looter, he was a, a scientist, he was, he was interested in history, he was interested in the history of the ocean. So a maritime archaeologist, Robert Stainwood from Belgium, discovered this wreck, he salvaged two of the cannons, he salvaged a little bit of pepper, Sadly enough, he looked and looked and looked, no diamonds. And then to the surprise of everyone, Chinese porcelain was unexpectedly discovered in thick hard mud, 290 complete pieces and 400 kilograms broken pieces and shards. He salvaged them all and he brought them up to the surface. Next slide, please. And so, 
he donated the 400 kilograms of fragments and shards to the Rijksmuseum for study. And these fragments were painstakingly cleaned, sorted, photographed, and described. And the information is now used to date early 17th century Chinese porcelain. Um, and the Rijksmuseum also acquired a number of complete pieces. And I love the, the, this piece that you see on the slide here. It consists of 18 fragments. So you can imagine how hard these, these, um, these people in the Rijksmuseum work to look at these 400 kilograms of shards and figure out that there was one uh, little bit of a piece that they could use for this and for that. And they put it all together in this particular plate. Uh, I once had a, a tour of the, the curator of the ceramic department because I was working, doing some research on one of the tiles that we had in our museum. And she helped me. And so she showed me the, the, um, the uh, uh, what's it called? I'm, I'm, my Dutch is interfering, um, the, where you store all your stuff in the museum. Uh, it's called the depot in, 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 in Dutch. But anyway, she showed me and they had shelves and shelves and shelves of shards of all these little pieces. Uh, next slide, please. So when you go to the museum, um, well, first of all, this is what happens uh, when they did all the investigation. They used all the shards oh, and they yeah, published them. And you can see- I was listening to a Chinese class that I- you can see these shards. And so the uh, Christina Peil, Ketel, that is a wonderful scientist who published this, uh, it's like an encyclopedia of this particular ship. ship. So the, all of these are made before 1613. This is what they call, what Lily was talking about in terms of type, type capsule. So here on this page, she draws the picture and then she has a whole number of pages of the shards that show that particular design and I show here another design and that is the book the ceramic load of the Vitaliel so you can see how important it is to be a science to, to approach it scientifically to investigate and really this is what really this, this particular load is really what uh, helped people understand the 17th century porcelain that was imported in the Netherlands because there was just it's just a total they talk about the dark ages they didn't know anything because there were no examples now we have examples since this ship next slide please so when you go to the museum the Rijksmuseum I love this this uh, exhibit because you see all these shards, shards these these broken pieces and you know that they were on the bottom of the ocean there by, by the uh, the island and um, you can still see them and um, it's really a wonderful exhibition um, next slide please in contrast is the salvaging of the Geldermalse. Lily talked about that in 1752. That ship, also a Dutch East Indies ship, sunk in Indonesian waters. Um, uh, this is 18th century. So now we're dealing with the 18th century and uh, not the 17th century. So um, then in 1985, Michael Hatcher, who was really interested in, 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 in discovering uh, uh, the, the wrecks of World War II planes and ships and so forth, so he could sell the, 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 the metal, he hit upon that wreck, as Lily explained, and he found of the 147 pieces of gold that were listed in the manifest, he found 125. Can you imagine? You're a treasure hunter, and that's what you find. You find the real gold. Fantastic. But he also salvaged an immense quantity of porcelain. And what did he do with the porcelain? Next slide, please. Well, he and Christie got together, and they had an auction. 20,000 people attended the auction and it made, as Lily already mentioned, $15.3 million. And I love this picture of all these Dutch people, probably international people. Uh, as Lily mentioned, there were some Chinese people also trying to get the, but you can see how far the line goes. It goes all the way down the street. They are standing in line to view these, this porcelain. A, they are still as crazy about uh, Chinese porcelain as they were in the 17th century. Uh, next slide, please. 
And so you saw the slide on the right in Lily's presentation, and I just have the other slide there. And you can imagine these people have waited in line for hours, and here they have a chance to look. And so this is the viewing day. Now, the important thing is that Christie sold it not as a VOC ship, as a Dutch East Indies ship. They sold it as Nanking Cargo. Um, which is the name of the city in China where these are porcelain left, the coast. But they knew it was the, 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 the Geldermalse. Next slide, please. So this sale at Christie's of the Geldermalse was a turning point. Such controversies, and you can still, whenever you read one of those 150,000 uh, articles about uh, the salvaging of it, you always mention, they always mention uh, Michael Hatcher as a thief and a looter, because what he did, he considered himself the owner of the ship and all of its porcelain. The porcelain made that money, the $50 million. Blooming Dale bought 3,000 pieces. It's gone. We don't know where it is. There, there are no pictures of that. Uh, we have, uh, there's no scientific evidence what 18th century porcelain looked like. He considered himself the owner. He sold it. He provided no, almost no archaeological documentation or the site information, as, as um, Bob mentioned, the importance of the ship, the, the other kinds of issues that you have. And Lily mentioned that also, um, it's not just the porcelain, it's also what, these, what, what did people bring on ships and so forth. And the exact location he kept secret as well. He discarded all the shards and broken pieces. He destroyed all the material that was not commercially viable, including the ship. People are so, so upset about that because it's so irresponsible because of that information that is lost forever. He paid nothing to Indonesia, even though it was found in Indonesia water. And then Christie sold the cargo under false pretenses by calling it Nanking cargo to collectors. And we have no information about it. So this is a quote that you will see from him and that is taken as kind of an evidence of what his state of mind was. He said, it was a race to get what we could before we would be interrupted by weather, rivals, pirates, or some government. And that's, of course, Indonesia. Next slide, please. And probably the Netherlands, too, because it was a Dutch ship. So the Geldermals in 1986 became a turning point. And after that, um, this is what, uh, what uh, Stan Stroostrand talks about, that uh, UNESCO, the United Nations, needs to do something. You get new rules and international laws for long-term management of maritime cultural resources. So in, you, in 2001, UNESCO passes a, uh, a, a, a convent, what is called the convention. It's not a law, it's a convention on the protection of underwater cultural heritage. It's ratified by 77 countries, so there are many countries have not ratified it. Requirement is, as far as UNESCO is concerned, that all traces of human existence underwater that are 100 years of older or older have to be protected. They established a code of good practice. That means you protect and preserve the location of the cultural heritage site. And there is a prohibition on sale of artifacts, which is, of course, um, very difficult to follow because people need to pay for the expense of the salvaging of the objects. Australia immediately the same year passed a Protection of Movable Cultural Heritage Act. And they, in their country, the object of cultural significance have to remain in Australia. So if it's in the Australian waters and you find something, it has to stay in Australia. You can't just take it to Christie's and sell it. Uh, Indonesia established some fantastic rules at the establishment of a shipwreck policy where it has requirements of registration. You have to have a deposit when you go salvage something. You have to have a license. You have to do maritime archaeologically and 50% of the sale has to be paid to Indonesia. So as far as Indonesia is concerned, you can sell it, but you have to share the money with Indonesia. Now, the problem is that they have 
practically no experts in terms of archaeology, uh, maritime archaeology, and they have no way to police all those islands that they have and all those places where you can have shipwrecks. So this is a very good policy, but ex to execute it is very difficult. And then the Netherlands established in 2007 the Department of Underwater Archaeology, and they claim whenever it is an East Indian ship, it is still in the it's still a Dutch ship, no matter if it's in Indonesian water or in, in, in uh, Vietnamese waters or if it's in the middle of the ocean, it's still that ship. Uh, I don't know if they can actually execute that, but that's what the they have this established. And then China, I just read an article uh, that just came out uh, on the regulations of the People's Republic of China on the protection and management of underwater cultural relics. And they are debating if they shall uh, sign UNESCO. Uh, this is just, uh, my page was full, but actually I also need to put in there the uh, maritime museums that passed law. Let me just see, I wrote it down. Um, they do not allow museums, well, this is of course a suggestion, not to exhibit or acquire objects that have been taken, looted, as you know, so they, they this, for example, the Rijksmuseum would never uh, exhibit anything from the Gelder Malsen because it was sell, uh, was looted. Uh, so that's what they say. And whenever something has been stolen, illegally salvaged from a from the country of origin, it's since 1990. It should not be exhibited or acquired. Next slide, please. And so this is a, was a little. Uh, uh, addition to Lily's wonderful talk about the ethics of salvaging underwater treasures and the Wittelier where which was the first one and then the Gelder Malsen turning point and it is a question of when you find something on the bottom of the ocean whose is it and what are you going to do with it thank you um I want to thank you very much Hilda uh, you never disappoint you know this is a wonderful <laughs> talk 